Thank you. Uh, so, uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to our lecture series organized by the International Society for Comparative Psychology. Today, we have the honor of have uh, as a guest uh, lecturer, uh, Dr. Eduardo Ottoni from University of Sao Paulo from Brazil. So, thank you, doctor. We are uh, really uh, honored to have you here. And so you can tell us about your different lines of research, specifically with the capuchin monkey. So uh, when you want to start, we are totally uh, ready. OK. So oh, before everything, thank you for the invitation. And good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. So today I will talk about uh, what we know by now about the use of tools by tufted capuchin monkeys. After more than a quarter of a century of field observations and experiments, and about the reasons supporting an understanding of these behavioral patterns as cultural traditions perpetuated and disseminated by socially biased learning processes. Uh, most definitions of culture by the humanities are still very close to Tyler's classical definition, uh, being something acquired by man was part of the definition. Uh, and to use was once conceived as a defining human trait uh, with, a, with a growing reliance on technology being seen as a key selective pressure uh, behind the evolution of human intellect. Uh, Imanishi, a founding father of Japanese primatology, was among the first to consider the idea of cultural traditions in non-human animals. But it took longer to some circles uh, of Western academic thought to expand the definition to any behavioral patterns uh, which permanence in an animal population repertoire relies on socially learned and transmitted information or socially biased learning. Uh, the spontaneous use of tools by wild populations of chimpanzees has become widely known through long-term field work. And beyond individual dexterity, it revealed uh, interpopulation variation that apparently could not be explained by genetic differences or by environmental affordances alone. Uh, the meta-analysis led by Andy White and examined the behavioral variability between the populations from long-term study sites, most of it associated to the use of tools, and excluding variation that could be explained away by ecological or genetic differences, and assuming that the remaining cases should be explained by different stories of social learning, constituting thus cultural traditions. Uh, the studies of the cultural nature of apes diversified toolkit greatly influenced our research on wild tufted capuchin monkeys to use. Uh, in the beginning, it was mostly about chimpanzees, but more or less at the same time we found about tufted capuchins stone to use, we learned about the use of probe tools by certain populations of orangutans. Especially interesting, was that uh, the customary probe use by orangutans was only observed under certain conditions of gregarity, that is, among populations with the largest female parties size. When Scheich and colleagues proposed three basic conditions for the emergence of tool use traditions in primates, adequate ecological context, high cognitive abilities, and social conditions uh, favoring information transfer. Uh, and they suggested that it was so theoretically possible that a socially tolerant monkey population, not ape, uh, would be found uh, in which routine use of feeding tools occurred, especially if the skills used were close to naturally occurring operants, and if opportunities for would-be learners were abundant. That is, they basically predicted capuchin and some macaques to use traditions. Uh, capuchin monkeys are now considered two genera, 
Cebus and Sapagius. So tufted capuchin monkeys refer to the genus Sapagius, the former Cebus apella species, and bearded capuchin monkeys to Sapagius libidinosus, our main subjects, which were the former Cebus apella libidinosus subspecies. And uh, by the way, uh, we recently learned about two use by a population of Cebus by Barrett and colleagues in uh, 2018, which was supposed to be one major difference between these genuses, but I won't discuss it now. Uh, Tufted capuchin monkey's spontaneous use of tools to crack palm nuts was first observed in semi-free groups in urban parks, like the Tietê Ecological Park near São Paulo, where we first found about uh, stone tools use. Long-term studies with wild populations were at the, at the time all done in the Amazon or the Atlantic forests, and there were no reports of two use from those sites. But when we started surveying tufted capuchin populations from savanna environments though, we found that percussive stone tools use was rather the rule than the exception. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, we established two field sites in the state of Piauí, in northeastern Brazil, for the study of savanna populations of Sapagius libidinosus. In Fazenda Boa Vista, the monkeys are specialized in the cracking of the extremely hard palm nuts found in the Cerrado. Uh, they do not rely only on the weight of the hammer stones, but also apply some downward force. And since the performance depends on the bodily mass, there's a strong male bias uh, in stone to use in this population. Uh, and they have to find these good hammers, which are very rare in the area. Serra da Capivara National Park is in the Caatinga, a more extremely seasonal kind of savanna uh, with different environmental affordances. Uh, the hard palm nuts uh, from the Cerrado are not available, but on the other hand, the availability of suitable lithic material is much greater. And many other fruits not as hard as the, the, the palm nuts to, to be cracked. That's probably the availability, great availability of suitable potential tools uh, is probably uh, part of the explanation for the enhanced toolkit. Uh, but Serra da Capivara monkeys not only habitually use stone tools for a wider variety of purposes, but they also use sticks as probing tools. So stone tools can be used for seed cracking uh, or for digging for spiders and insects nests or digging for plants, roots, and tubers. Or, for instance, for cashew nut processing, which helps them to avoid uh, biting directly the unripe nuts because of the caustic liquid surrounding them. The use of stones stone tools in this population is not a recently established behavior. Uh, with the aid of archaeological techniques and in collaboration with a team of archaeologists uh, in Serra da Capivara, we found evidence that stone tool use by capuchins is quite old. Uh, it dates back at least 3,000 years for now. We didn't dig any further for now. Uh, an unexpected result is, is that wild birded capuchin monkeys deliberately break stones uh, using other stones and unintentionally sometimes producing sharp edged flakes that somehow resemble intentionally produced hominin tools. So more recently, uh, to, to calm the archeologists, we, we, we found some potential differences between these this tools. Uh, the production of archaeologically visible cores and flakes is therefore no longer unique to the human lineage, providing a comparative perspective on the emergence of lithic technology. 
this discovery adds an additional dimension to interpretations of the human paleolithic record, uh, the possible function of early stone tools, and the cognitive requirements for the emergence of stone flaking. Uh, by the way, uh, Serra da Capizara is also one of the most amazing human archaeological sites in South America. Differently from stone use, though there have been a couple of anecdotal reports of isolated events from distinct populations, the customary use of sticks as probes has only been observed in the Serra da Capivara population. Probe tools in Serra da Capivara are also used for a variety of purposes, such as probing insects or spider nests, but mostly, like in this clip, to dislodge lizards from rock crevices. Differently from stone tools, which the monkeys basically just select, probe tools are frequently modified before use, side branches and leaves removed, things like that. The use of Probe tools is much less conspicuous, even for us humans observers, than at cracking. So it's probably underreported to some extent. Uh, but its verified absence in Fazenda Boa Vista, uh, one of our long term studies, uh, is hard to explain by environmental affordances alone. Uh, to make things more mysterious, there's an even strong male bias in probe use. In Serra da Capivara, they crack uh, less harder things, so there's no that much bias in, in the use of percussive tools in Serra da Capivara. As we compare the two kits of different populations, uh, following the so-called exclusion method, uh, there are no really compelling motives to so far to think about genetic differences. We have semi-free tool using hybrids, in, in urban parks, mixed lab groups, uh, forest sapages limidinosos that don't use tools, and Serra da Capivara and Fazenda Boa Vista are relatively close, but very different in, in performance. Uh, ecological factors, on the other hand, clearly play a role uh, 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 in the distribution patterns of some forms of tool use, but not all. Uh, as we are uh, based uh, in long-term studies with forest and savanna populations, uh, the degree of terrestriality is a better predictor of stone to use than food availability. And uh, we also found uh, it, it's more a matter of opportunity than necessity, the use of uh, tools for cracking nuts since nuts and other fruit are usually available at the same time of the year, so nuts are no fallback food. We further found that Serra da Capivara groups are more terrestrial than, than Fazenda, da, Fazenda Boa Vista monkeys, 43% uh, against 27% of daily activity time. So stone to use diversity and terrestriality in these cases appear to be positively correlated. An ecological explanation uh, based on the relative abundance of suitable lithic material may also apply to the differences uh, uh, in the diversification of lithic tools, more varied in Serra da Capivara, where proper stones are abundant, and more specialized in Boa Vista, where they are rarer. But these potential explanations are not mutually exclusive. Uh, though the comparative approach between populations may point us interesting targets for further study. It has been criticized as a means of demonstrating cultural traditions uh, because it does not actually examine the role of social interactions and social niche construction uh, in the individual acquisition of the behaviors. And so it's prone to false negatives and positives. So, the way to complement it is by means of longitudinal and developmental naturalistic studies, as well as field experiments on behavior innovation and diffusion.
since the beginning of our research, we paid attention to the ontogenetic development of tool use behavior. Uh, stone tools to use to crack nuts uh, slowly develops from the inept manipulation of nuts and rocks by infants along the first years of life. And it's easy to perceive the importance of infant curiosity in their selectivity of observational targets in, on the one hand, and adult males tolerance to close observation and scrounging on the other. More recently, we investigated the development of probe to use in eight infants in Serra da Capivara to clarify whether social influence on learning varied between the sexes. Uh, we found that in the first 10 months of age, females manipulate sticks as much as males, but after 10 months, uh, males begin to manipulate them at higher frequencies. We examined if social connected connections uh, as opportunities for social learning could explain this difference and verify that on close distance social networks, infant males and females have similar connections with older males. However, uh, uh, males observe a probe to use events more often than females when close to such events. So the higher frequency of uh, manipulation of sticks as well as the higher rates of probe to use observation can thus be, uh, can thus be key to understanding uh, why only males uh, are probe to users in this population. And since there are only male or mostly uh, male potential models of pro to use, the sex motivational bias could explain uh, the sex difference in observation and a bias of in observation could explain the differences in manipulation and manipulations rates uh, uh, certainly influence the chances of individual trial and error learning after some stimulus enhancement from conspecifics. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's an extremely improbable event to watch uh, an individual innovation show up uh, and spread along among a wild group of, uh, or a population. Sometimes we are lucky. In the Pedra Furada group, we observed uh, what seemed to be the spread of a new fad among adult females. Uh, the communicative use of stone projectiles as an apparent enhancement to their sexual receptivity displays. First one, then another female, later three more, uh, during early estrus throwing stones on preferred males to call their attention. Uh, and it's interesting because aimed stone throwing had only been observed before in a lab experiment by Westergaard and Suomi in 1994. Field experiments can be used to create such innovative situations on demand. And one of our first field experiments was meant to investigate how different toolkits affect problem solving strategies. Uh, since we had this perfect situation, two long term well studied populations, just uh, 350 kilometers apart, uh, with different two kids, uh, and in Fazenda Boa Vista, we could be sure about the absence of probe to use. So we exposed a group in each site to the same novel task of probing a uh, molasses filled uh, plexiglass boxes. So uh, in Serra da Capivara, all adult and juvenile males quickly learned to extract the molasses with their own self-produced probes. Uh, and Fazenda Boa Vista, on the other hand, no monkey ever solved the task. Uh, after more than twice the time uh, of exposition to the box, after sampling some molasses from the top of the box in the habituation phase, though they show interest in the contents, they quickly stopped visiting the boxes at all. Uh, sorry. Uh, afterwards, during an extra facilitation phase with pre-inserted sticks available, uh, the, they did just what females did in Serra da Capivara when they found uh, probes 
left inserted by males. They extract them, licked them, dropped the probes, and never reinserted them. And even more curious, and contrary to our predictions, no monkeys in Boa Vista ever try to crack the boxes with stones. Serra da Capivara monkeys, though, did it sometimes before devising the most effective technique, which we attributed uh, to their already known, more diversified use of lithic tools. That was his first time. Uh, so what we observed here uh, is that the available repertoire of two use apparently shaped their interaction with a novel problem. Uh, this already more diversified use of lithic tools. The challenge of identifying uh, social learning and naturalistic non-controlled context spawn uh, new data analysis methodologies such as network-based diffusion analysis or NBDA, which aims to tell apart uh, a diffusion resulting of resulting from cumulative individual learning from the socially facilitated learning of the task. Um, you can have the social networks and at the time or the order of the acquisition of the behaviors, depending on the precise of the measures. And, and so to explore the role of social proximity and interaction in the diffusion of, of a novel behavior, we expose two groups in Serra da Capivara to this uh, open diffusion field experiment where a novel foraging task was introduced and the inception and diffusion of solutions tracked. Uh, the apparatus consisted of a plexly gas box, uh, which released food either by lifting a flap or pulling a rod. One monkey in each group was trained as a demonstrator, lift for Jurubeba group, pull for Pedra Furada group. And experimental sessions uh, took 14 days for each group and each daily season lasted as long as the group remained there. And the presence of conspecific observers uh, was registered at different distances. Uh, as the new behavior spread, the monkeys observed a conspecific solving the task at least once before solving it themselves. By the end of the experiment, 34 individuals across both groups had solved the task uh, at least once uh, in a total of almost 9,000 episodes with 92% of these episodes observed by at least one count specific. For both groups, there was a clear bias towards the lift action. So an option bias analysis comparing the diffusion of the particular observed technique would lead to the conclusion that no imitation strict sense, uh, meaning a copy of the precise whole sequence of movement, was involved in the social transmission, uh, uh, pointing to something like stimulus enhancement, attracting the, the attention of the, the individual to that uh, target object, uh, if social diffusion is involved. So uh, in the following results, uh, uh, both techniques for solving the task are pulled together. So that's uh, the performance of the groups along the time, successful individuals. And in NBDA evaluates whether the pattern of diffusion of information is better explained by models informed by the social context or merely by an asocial model. Uh, socially transmitted behavior should spread at a higher rate between individuals who are more strongly connected to more frequently associations or interactions in mostly in the context of the experimental situation. 
uh, so to compare uh, an asocial, uh, asocial and socially informed models, we need two sets of data. Uh, first, the, the diffusion uh, of the novel trait uh, and a social network detailing the strengths of connection between group members in, in a particular context. Uh, so uh, these are uh, illustrations of, uh, of, about the, the social networks uh, for observation within five meters for both groups. Uh, edge thickness is proportional to the frequency of observation between subjects. Note side is proportional to the number of times an individual was observed. Uh, the pie charts on the, uh, on the nodes indicate the proportion of options used to solve the task successfully. Blue uh, lift and green pool, and black for the monkeys that never solved the task. To make the analysis more robust, uh, avoiding false positives, uh, uh, this method uh, involves uh, the use of uh, some extra parameters, uh, individual ones. So the individual uh, level parameters we use to inform the social task, uh, dominance, neophobia, and opportunities to interact with the task. Uh, dominance and neophobia tested in different situations. Uh, but these factors can slow down the rate of diffusion or speed it depending on the variation. If the diffusion of the trait is best explained by the, by the individual level variables, asocial learning factors could be considered responsible for the diffusion pattern observed, just individual learning. Uh, however, if a model based on a combination of the social influence and the opportunities to observe on specific solving the task is a better fit to the diffusion data, then there is reason to believe that social learning is occurring. Uh, we found strong support for social learning of task solution. When social model was informed by a network portraying observation events within five meters of the task, NBDA found a better fit for it in both groups. So uh, conversely, when the social model was informed by a network of observation events from above five meters, the other way, uh, and uh, 10 meters mostly, and BDA uh, did not find a significant better fit for one model over another for either group. This suggests perhaps that local enhancement focused on the movable parts of the apparatus. So important to be you know, closer distance. So the results of closer distance for closer distance also point to the key role of social tolerance in the diffusion of new behaviors. We were also interested in investigating which social networks portrayed uh, relationships conducive to social learning, uh, even though they are not involved in the actual event. So for that purpose, we collected data outside experimental situation on four social networks, grooming, social play, co-feeding, and social proximity. When grooming networks uh, were used to inform the social model, it was better at predicting the diffusion of the novel experimental trait than the social model in both groups. On the other hand, play networks led NBDA to select the asocial model, suggesting that play relationships were not good predictions uh, predictors uh, of the spread of information in a foraging task. Uh, these, of course, are not direct measures of social learning opportunities in our text, but they are, however, interesting proxies informing us which type of relationships can predict uh, information transmission growths. And finally, uh, the skewed flow betweenness for each individual across our networks, that's how an individual is more central or more peripheral, uh, to the uh, to the net shows that dominant individuals hold the most central positions in terms of network flow and play a central role in the information flow through the network, critically affecting the diffusion of the new behavior. Uh, the pathways uh, 
meaning the opportunities of social learning are directly uh, uh, directed uh, along the strongest of tolerant relationships and group members vary greatly in the likelihood of information reaching them. So these results uh, provide direct evidence for social learning in wild border capuchin monkeys supporting the claims of cultural traditions in this clade. The NBDA finding that a social model informed by close range observation uh, predicted the diffusion pattern of the novel forage behavior uh, points to the importance of social tolerance in the dissemination okay? and the densely connected social networks recorded for capuchin monkey groups of Serra Capivara imply that uh, they form cohesive groups despite of the uh, unusually large size uh, groups and large social groups would be expected to generate and sustain a greater number of innovations. So the combination of large group sizes and tolerant and cohesive social networks may help also to explain the uniquely large two kids found in Serra da Capivara population. Uh, as I mentioned before, in our probing experiment, uh, comparing Serra da Capivara to Fazenda Boa Vista monkeys, in their first attempts, a few Pedra Furada males tried and successfully to break uh, the boxes with stones, but quickly switched to the more effective technique. Uh, contrary to uh, our prediction, though, uh, the Chican group monkeys, uh, uh, group, group of monkeys in Fazenda Boa Vista never transported attempted to use stone tools to crack the sealed box open, uh, as some of uh, individuals uh, in Pedra Furada did. So our provisional hypothesis is that stone tool use was already more generalized among Serra da Capivara monkeys, and that made further generalization more probable. A few years later in Serra da Capivara, when exposed to a very different plexiglass pod and box, the Pedra Furada group, but not the Jurubeba group, who did not take part in the previous experiment, promptly brought some twigs to the apparatus in the first experimental sessions. In an experiment on the innovation and diffusion of probe tools use in the semi-free group of Chiete Park, which were net, not probe users, we exposed them to two problem boxes from which molasses or solid food could be extracted. Uh, this is the molasses box with top holes from where molasses could be extracted by inserting a probe. And this is the solid food box which side holes from where seeds or food pellets could be extracted by pushing them uh, to the back of the box. In a preliminary test, the molasses box was offered without providing any sticks, but after five hours of interaction with the box, no monkey tried to extract the molasses with self-produced probes. After that, sticks were provided by the box. And in some sessions of facilitation, when we are trying to induce one innovator uh, to start the spread, sticks were pre-inserted in the box. Typically, no proficient monkeys uh, uh, who extracted pre-inserted sticks just dropped them without reinserting, as did the non-probing, uh, non-probe using wild monkeys. Data collection in the presential recording phase lasted 75 non-consecutive days and resulted in 92 recorded hours of monkeys interaction with the boxes. And after a four month interval in the camera trap phase, uh, uh, which lasted uh, 49 uh, consecutive days uh, with two brief interruptions, uh, both boxes were continuously available side by side along uh, with a generous number of wooden sticks nearby. After 13 seconds back there and in the presential recording phase and 70 hours of group interaction with the molasses box, a single adult male, Acacio, started probing it successfully after almost two hours of non-continuous exploration and manipulation activity at the box and the, in the whole phase. 
And shortly after retrieving some pre-inserted uh, probes in the facilitated condition, then no more facilitation. And uh, when the solid food box was introduced, Acacio successfully used sticks to extract, its, extract seeds in his first visit after less than 12 minutes. But after 82 sessions or 92 hours of group interaction with the boxes, no one else had succeeded so far. So after a four-month break, we decided to give them another chance. Uh, uh, and during the next 49 days of continuous availability of both box, uh, uh, monitored by uh, permanent camera traps, uh, with sticks available nearby, five more adults started probing the box. But it took a long time also. First, everyone, uh, the molasses box to which they were exposed longer in the previous phase. And we, so we compared the behavior uh, of this, the this five new proficient males, the innovator not included, uh, with the next five more active but unsuccessful males. And there was no significant difference uh, in the time spent at the box between proficient and non-proficient males. Uh, Pre-inserted uh, probe extraction did not seem to have any uh, immediate effect on success, except perhaps for Acacia, the, the innovator. And observation of proficient individuals probing then afterwards, it was not quickly followed by any probing attempts by the observer. The only significant difference between successful and unsuccessful males uh, was the frequency of uh, total stick manipulation before the first successful probing. And the increases in stick manipulation frequently followed probing observation. So observing a proficient model did not immediately induce probing attempts by naive observers, uh, which would suggest, uh, if it happened, that uh, straightforward imitation or emulation at least. Uh, so, but, uh, and so in, uh, what happened is that most of the proficient individuals succeeded long before after their first probing observations. Social information, like, insertion observation by proficient, uh, uh, scrounging opportunities uh, with leftover uh, uh, sticks already used though, as well as facilitated conditions during pre-inserted probes, apparently led in some cases to increases uh, in the frequency of stick manipulation, enhancing the opportunities for trial and error learning. So stimulus enhancement uh, could be the key mechanism involved here, but it's hard to disentangle effects of social enhancement for individual learning process. So we are currently, uh, currently examining analytical strategies to reinforce this argument. We are still under analysis. But uh, the first successful probing events seem to occur inadvertently after clumsy manipulation of sticks on the molasses box. And even then, most of these successful uh, uh, subjects for the first time did not start uh, proficiently probing systematically right after that. And some never did, as in this guy's accidental insertion, which apparently did not result in any learning immediately. After taking so long to learn uh, to probe the molasses, though, generalization to, a successfully, to successfully using sticks to extract seeds from the solid food box was extremely fast for those five uh, prober monkeys. It took them months overall and hours of direct interaction uh, with the molasses box to learn to probe it, but it took a few minutes of interaction in their first visits to the solid box to succeed, even though the probing technique was not identical. Months later, 
a, a distinct sort of uh, problem box, uh, not meant for probing in another experiment, also elicited stick probing attempts by the, the those successful probers from the previous experiment. So social influences in two use learning seem to involve non-imitative learning mechanisms such as stimulus or local enhancement. But, and the observation of proficient two, uh, two users performing the task uh, uh, apparently uh, elicits enhanced manipulation of tools and their targets uh, leading to slow trial and error learning. And after succeeding in solving a problem with, with a given tool, though, uh, uh, trying to extend its use to other problems can be very quick, especially when potential tools are available. So diversify, diversifying the context of use of a given tools potentially enhances the chances of reinforcement and potential, uh, potential further diversification. And so also the creating more opportunities for observation by other naive individuals. So to use generalization can boost the establishment of behavioral traditions, uh, not only by increasing diet individual rewards, but also enhancement those opportunities for socially biased learning by those the other individuals. But back to opportunities for social learning and cultural niche construction. And can uh, the, uh, what about terrestriality and forests? The difference between uh, savanna and forest populations may be related not only to terrestriality, but also to different opportunities uh, for observation of conspecific behavior, which is as you're on the ground. You know? Uh, to start with, uh, the terrestriality argument does not hold in the case of probe use. Think about orangutans. Uh, but in the forest, as compared to the savanna, there are also visibility issues uh, and also uh, smaller groups and smaller foraging parties because of fusion, fusion uh, foraging. So, the greater complexity of Serrata capivara capuchins toolkit may also be related to group size. The Serrata capivara groups tend to be big, with something sometimes more than 50 individuals, while the group studied in Fazenda Boa Vista was at the time of our initial study composed by 10 individuals. So, in theory, uh, the smaller the social group, the lesser are the opportunities for innovation and the maintenance of learned techniques. But uh, can observa observability biases explain the sex bias in probe use? Because there are, as far as we know, no differences in abilities related to tool use, only uh, strength body mass issues that bias lytic tool use in the case of harder nuts. But females did master probe use and uh, experimentally induced conditions. And, uh, uh, and also, they also do it in Serra Capivara. So, since uh, socially biased learning of probe use uh, in most natural conditions uh, depends on direct observations of quick and frequently unpredicted behaviors, uh, the group social dynamics uh, might bias the opportunities of males and females. Uh, sex-biased social networks and social proximity might explain uh, sex-biased intergroup diffusion. Uh, as I mentioned before, in the first 10 months of age, females manipulated sticks as much as males, but after that, males observed probe to use events more often than females when close to such events. So the higher frequency of tool manipulation of sticks, as well as the higher rates of probe to use, can explain uh, why only males uh, or almost only males are told to use in the populations. No? And since there are only male potential models of probe use, a sex motivational bias could be involved in, in the sex difference uh, in observation. And this bias could then expl explain the difference of observation in manipulation and manipulation rates that would influence the chances of individual learning by trial and error. But also 
bias and two views uh, perhaps can explain interdiffusion, uh, intergroup diffusion patterns. The amount of the capuchins, adult males, tend to migrate from one group to the other, while females are mostly philopatric. And this might create different opportunities for intergroup diffusion. So compare, for instance, probe two use, which is male bi biased, and is present in all observed uh, groups in Serra da Capivara. And females stone enhanced estrus display, which is so far was only observed in one group. Well, so as I discussed before, ecological factors such as terrestriality, hard food and proper stones availability can account for interpopulational differences too and percussive to use, but, but then uh, what about uh, stick probes? Uh, raw material uh, is available everywhere, and there are no big differences in, in, in predation of uh, animals like lizards, uh, also hunted in Boa Vista. So what? So a key factor underlying the radical distinct patterns of occurrence of stone and probe to use in wild populations may be related to the distinct degrees of niche construction. Fragazzi and colleague proposed a complementary perspective uh, to socially biased learning models framed in the niche construction theory. And they suggested that just observing, just observing behavior is not enough to learn to use a tool uh, and that enduring artifacts like stone tools in nut cracking sites and, and nut leftovers scaffold individuals practice and learning. That it seems Okay, in the case of nut cracking, but then uh, they go on to affirm that uh, all investigated cases of habitual to use in white chimpanzees and capuchin monkeys include youngsters encountering durable artifacts, most often in a supportive social context. While this applies to chimpanzees' probe use, at least when performed uh, repeatedly at the same termite mounts, which is the main case of chimpanzee probe use. Uh, it does not seem to be the case to, uh, uh, of the less predictable probe use uh, uh, of Serra da Capivara capuchins. And so there's some serious differences in the observation opportunities of probes and nut cracking, differences in duration and predictability of the behaviors and the permanences of artifacts and opportunities for scrounging. In the case of probe use as compared to stone nut cracking, opportunities of direct social learning are probably reduced. And those uh, of, for interaction with a modified environment, almost no. So potential observability bias may be associated to different learning opportunities uh, for distinct behaviors, uh, which could help uh, explaining the very distant distributions of stone and probe tools. Uh, there are no, nothing equivalent to cracking sites. The monkey is climbing the, the hill, there's the, the suddenly finds uh, uh, a lizard, uses the probe and then leases it and never in the same place. So uh, beyond diet observation learning, uh, nut cracking creates opportunities for socially biased learning through environmental niche construction why probe use typically does not. So, summing up, uh, the distinct degrees of niche construction and observability associated to different forms of tool use may help to explain the difference between the widespread stone tool use traditions and the rare case of customary probe use, where individual innovations may occur, but seldom spread by socially mediated learning. Uh, so, Tufted Capucci Monkey's technological traditions seem to result from innovations uh, uh, facilitated by native predispositions and environmental affordances and perpetuated by means of non imitative forms of social learning. And so, that was it. I hope I didn't run too much, but thank you for your patience. And to our teams, people in our teams, past and present, to Fundan, the, the archaeological institution in Serra da Capivara, and to the funding agencies. And
Thank you.